Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this first workshop. We're gonna be covering uh, some real basic concepts involving uh, uh, the concept of design, right? And this is a design competition and a product development competition. They're, they're very interrelated, so you may find it to be fairly effective in, in focusing on, on both one or the other. Um, I, I encourage all of you to go ahead and uh, and ask questions. I'll keep my eye on the chat window as I can and, and letting people in as we can. But obviously uh, with, with things, it's a small group to get started and we're excited about the opportunity of where this is gonna be, where this is gonna be going. Uh, so first of all, welcome. We appreciate you being here. For those of you who don't know, uh, the competitions are, are jointly run, but they're two, technically two separate competitions. There's the Butterworth competition, uh, that's focused around uh, ICS and the and the, the software side of things, and then there's the Beal competition, which tends more to have hardware elements involved. Um, the 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 summary of the competition, in case you've missed it, uh, it's really focused around uh, excellence in product design and development um, of the of you, the students, uh, going through this. It's open to all UCI students, undergraduate and graduate. In the end, you choose which competition you'd like to be uh, be a part of. You'll notice there it says must be entirely comprised of matriculated UCI students. So, uh, one of the things Sai could do is if you have the chance, you could work on his project and then you know and uh, be a part of it. Uh, even though he's not a student uh, here, your team competing in this competition would have to be uh, all coming from uh, from UCI. Um, in the end, the many people do it for the prize money. That's perfectly good. That's why we have it is to help encourage you to have an opportunity. Um, there's a first, second, and third prize in each one of the categories, uh, Beal and Butterworth. So up to $10,000 can be earned uh, through this. Uh, so a total of $40,000 is being given away. And of course, when it comes to due dates, this is all on the website. But uh, when you get a chance, in fact, I encourage you to do it right now, uh, is you can go to that intent to enter. Um, I'll put it in the, the link the link in here for you. Hopefully I can type it properly. Uh, and intent, I don't, uh, but if you haven't done an intent to enter, there's nothing committing about it. It's just a chance for us to know that you're interested in the competition. If you haven't done it, please do that. There will be a product spec we'll be due in a little over a month. Um, this is not something that is graded. There's a template on the website, but it really gives you an idea, us an idea as judges, what you're, you're looking to do so that we can give you early feedback on to uh, what the project is that you're trying to accomplish and, and how you're going to move forward with it. Um, we'll do a midpoint review, which effectively is we'll go through and look at all the product specs. And then on April 23rd, we'll schedule a, a 10 minute or 15 minute or so opportunity to meet with you as judges to discuss with you what we saw in it, things that you might want to redirect or point towards or consider exploring or whatever that might be. Um, and it really gives you a chance to get some feedback in the middle and early, early on in the competition, rather than getting all the way to the finals and you know realizing, oops, well, had we known that it would have been better. Uh, now you get to get the feedback early on. And then about a, uh, you know, a few weeks after that is when you'll present your final product and business case. This will be a document. Um, we're gonna probably refine that one a little. So that template, I wouldn't quite jump into quite yet, um, but there'll be a video demo. Instead of us all getting together in a room and you showing us a nice demo, you'll get the chance to film it and take 27 takes if that's what you have to do to, to get it the way you want it. Um, but it'll be give you that video demo to, to pull it together. And then we will have an actual demo day where we will have watched the videos, read your business cases and your pro pro final product case. And then you'll say, okay, look, here's what we're doing. And we'll, you'll show us a little bit of the demo and we'll really get to dive into some Q&A and really understand the value of what you've created. And then of course, the big one, will decide who the winners are and announce that on awards night on May 24th. So that's kind of the highlight. This is a schedule. I'm not going to go through it all, but here we are in design workshop number one. We're towards the beginning. I encourage you, if you have friends in your capstone classes or anything anywhere across campus, I highly encourage you to consider working uh, with uh, some friends from across campus, not just ICS or engineering students, uh, but really across campus to form a team so that you can get a well-balanced approach to the design that you're you're looking to do. And so there's lots of schedule. Again, this, these, the deck will be posted for you as well as uh, the recording, but all of this information is provided to you uh, up on the website as well. So with, are there any questions I can answer about the competition itself? 
feel free to unmute. I guarantee you during this evening, we will get the chance to unmute and, uh, and have a chance to talk with each other. Uh, but any questions at this point before we jump in? No? If you do have a question, feel free to unmute or throw something into the, the chat window. Um, my first thing I'd like to do, if we can, I'd like you to take a minute, open up a browser, grab your phone, whatever's comfortable for you, and, and just go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and type in that code 5477000, and answer the question, what is good design? Right, what is good design? All right, so I'm going to give you guys uh, maybe 90 seconds or so uh, to, to hack away at that, and then we'll, uh, we'll return and chat a little bit. I should mention, you can put in more than one word, right? So whatever phrase or words come to mind. Give about another 10, 15 seconds, and then we'll move forward. Cool. If you come up with some, if you think of some things, uh, feel free to at any point jump in and throw another phrase in. Uh, but uh, we'll take a look at those in a little bit. So what we want to do is, is this is a design competition and, and understanding good design is actually really kind of hard. Um, if fundamentally we, we talk about it and there's, you know, you say, oh gosh, you know, gosh, good design should be something or other, but it's actually kind of difficult to really comprehend uh, what is the good design and what isn't and what's, what's really going to work and not work. And so, um, I, what I'd like to take a moment to do is look and say, okay, what isn't good design? Like there's something intuitively wrong with it. Um, and what I wanna do is see if you guys can unmute and, and just yell out if you would, please. And, and I'm hoping each one of you will get the chance to say something. I'm gonna throw up some pictures. I want you to give me an idea what, what makes it so this isn't good design, all right? This is the easy one. So if, if you wanna, if you're afraid of, of jumping in, now's a good one to jump in on. Uh, there just seems to be a lot of buttons and we don't know exactly what does what, especially because there's like some of them have the same design, like the second remote, which has two circles. We don't know which controls yeah. what. It's not very intuitive. Yep. Very good. Right. It's not intuitive. Too many buttons. Any other thoughts about what makes these so they're maybe not good design? Oh, you guys are a tough crowd. All right, let's move to the next one. Obviously, the big one is just there's, there's too many buttons. And I'm looking to do one thing, right? Turn up the volume, change channels, whatever it is. And I look at this thing. What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> like, which sometimes you see two different volume buttons. I was at my, my in-laws this past weekend, and they had this massive remote that had more buttons than any of these. And, and she said, oh, if you need to change the volume, use the right volume change, not the left volume change. I'm like, how can you have two different volume changes? Like, this is, this is awkward. Um, but too many buttons is clearly a design issue. Anyone see any problems with these? 
uh they kind of serve no purpose and there's like things in the way yep right like what's the purpose of those steps on the side there i mean you know, it doesn't go anywhere. I mean, maybe it balances out, but couldn't that be better used? I mean, it maybe is pretty or aesthetic somehow, but it's awkward with that wall there. How about the second picture? I think that's kind of a major safety concern. <laughs> it's a big problem, right? Somebody who walks, opens the door, falls right onto a stairwell, right? There's, and what's the function? I mean, imagine the door. Someone's walking up the steps, somebody else opens the door whack they get hit and go flying down the stairs i mean these are these are very obvious bad designs but they're a good way for us to say well what is it about it that's bad right i mentioned on this this image on the left that the problem really is that this is not functional doesn't go anywhere um you know this one there's a safety concern like you mentioned right is there a functionality that issue here potentially Right. What is it about these things that make the design poorer than others? Right. Is kind of the question to ask. How about the one on the left here? Right. Say it again, Kumar. Yeah. Yeah. In the same, it's kind of a similar kind of design for different kind of markers. So pretty misleading. Yeah, so now there's this issue of it looks too similar, too consistent, and you can't distinguish between one and the other. And what's it like when you use permanent marker on a whiteboard? It's pretty bad, pretty right? <laughs> exactly. Well said, Christopher. Pretty permanent, right? It's a terrible issue because now you've been consistent with your design, which you frequently hear about. Consistency is good, but sometimes you need differentiation. And in this case, there's one. How about, what's wrong with the, uh, with the one on the right? Are the temperatures, like the colder it gets, the more blue is, or, or sorry, the colder it gets, it gets red. Yeah, doesn't that yeah. feel wrong? That definitely feels wrong. Like Minnesota is gonna be toasty in, in the 90s and California is gonna be in a deep freeze, right? Like it, the color scheme, it's designed, it's visual, and yet the, the colors that they've used now don't match and it becomes counterintuitive. And if we saw this on a map, we'd say, wait a minute, I get that they've used colors, but be, the colors they've chosen don't feel right, right? And what it does is it becomes awkward feeling because our common perception is that blues in lighter colors like the ones at the bottom, right, are a bit colder and that reds and oranges and purples even are are a little bit more uh, of a challenge uh oh in walks trouble hi cynthia speaking of cynthia and wonderful design she used to be in the furniture business she'll appreciate this um uh anything let's let's go with the one on the left Did anyone see a problem with this design Right, pretty obvious, right? What's wrong with it though? Let's verbalize what's wrong with this design. Well, in all of these, they didn't take the human physique into account, obviously. It's not functional, right? Imagine you're trying to eat, you got this board sitting in your face, right? There's a functionality that they've forgotten it. And, and if you, Ladies sometimes have a, a harder time with the second photo, but not that hard of a time to imagine what that would be like, right? You can't have one, two people standing in the same spot, to put it cleanly, right? And that, that just creates, it might look good on paper, but they didn't think from the human perspective. And then, of course, the last one, anyone notice anything strange about that one? Uh, did they wrap it with plastic? They wrapped it with plastic. Now, how can we verbalize what's wrong with that? We know it's funny and it's kind of ironic, but it's a design thing, right? They, they, they designed this book and it has a statement on the front and then it ended up being shrink wrapped, right? Like what, what did they forget? Like what, how could we verbalize what the issue is? They're not supporting their claim really. Yeah, it's almost dishonest. Yeah. Right? It's not being true to themselves that they shrink wrapped this book. Now, my guess is they had no idea. 
they probably had them made. They built, you know, made these uh, these uh, books and designed them, and then sent them off to a manufacturer who said, "We'll produce them and get them out to Barnes and Noble." And they had no idea because they just didn't think through the whole process and ask the questions to realize they're going to shrink wrap them. And I'm sure there's a purpose to the shrink wrapping, right? To protect the book, to protect the paper, to prevent people from opening them and marking them up inside, you know, these kinds of things. Um, prevent theft, you know, shrink wrap can actually be a theft deterrent, these kinds of things. Um, but again, it just, you've now become dishonest as a brand or as a message, right? And of course, it's not just visual things that matter, right? Many people associate design with visual elements, like you have to have the right logo and the right sizing and that, you know, good design is crap, as, as people jokingly say, right? That you have to have the right fonts and the right elements together. And that's a part of design, but it is not good design. The visual element of design is only one component of design. We can all imagine things where we've seen amazing products that just don't look good, right? For whatever reason that the product or the brand or something doesn't rub us the right way. Visual can matter, but it's not just about visual, right? Design is certainly more, uh, much bigger than just that, right? And so, Ultimately, design, if you really want to break it down, is, is like beauty, right? And, and this quote about leadership from Warren Bennis, I think, is similar. You know, leadership is like beauty. It's hard to define, but when you know it, when you see it. And people have defined beauty, right? Symmetrical face or, you know, symmetrical design or color contrasts that are pleasing. You know, they come up with all sorts of things. But it's really kind of hard to define. Now, if you're a political science person, this quote really more harkens back into a 1964 Supreme Court justice who said that well, there was a case about pornography. And then the arguments, they finally said, look, just it, I can't define pornography. I just know it when I see it. Right. And I and in a positive way, I like to think of good design and frankly, bad design as being that it's something you can you just intuitively know. And here's the terrible thing about that. It's horribly subjective, right? And at the same time, it's amazingly universal in its ability to be attractive to a large group of people. Not everyone will like all good design, of course, but it is something that you can appreciate when you see it and it does jump out in a way. And so as a design competition, one of the keys is to figure out when we're designing our product, how do we make it so that what we're designing has good design? That when a judge panel, frankly, at the end of this, looks at your demo and what you're trying to do, that something pops out and says, this is good design, that it is hard to define, but they see it. It pops out from whatever you do that, wow, this is actually good design, right? And there's lots of elements that can go into that. One of the more famous uh, designers, excuse me, is, is Dieter Rams, who basically said there's 10 principles to good design. And I'll note that he specifically said there are 10 most important principles. And it was interesting that he defined it that way, saying that it's the most important principles of design, because ultimately he said, but this is an incomplete list. It is not everything involved in design. It is the top 10 most important principles of design. And so I thought we'd take a little time to walk through some of these and give you some quotes from uh, Dieter about these and get an idea as to how you can think of these in your own products context. Because ultimately these are all the little abstract concepts that formulate the foundation for you creating a good design with what you're trying to do. Right. So the first one is innovative. Right. And it sounds kind of intuitive, like, well, duh, great designs can be innovative, uh, but they're not all. So I'll read this for you in case you're having a hard time seeing it. The possibilities for innovation are not by any means exhausted. By the way, this is about 55, 60 years ago that, that uh, he came up with these. Technological development is always offering new opportunities for innovative design, but innovative design always develops in tandem with innovative technology and can never be an end in itself, right? So innovative design always develops in tandem with technology, right? And design itself is not the point, right? You, it works in tandem with some sort of technology. And what's interesting about that is obviously we're in an engineering and computer science type of environment. That innovation that happens of the technology 
has to work hand in glove with doing something innovative with the design. A great example where design makes a big difference, where the underlying technology didn't change much, is the iPod. If you remember the iPod, it's, if some of you are too young, now I feel really old. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just pretend like you guys remember an iPod from when you were, I don't know, in diapers probably. But the, the iPod revolutionized the music industry because it made an MP3 player simple and easy to use. Apple really cracked through by creating a design that wasn't complicated. There were other MP3 players. You had Sony models out and all these other things that were out that were more complicated. They looked more like those remote controls at the beginning of the presentation with, you know, 47 buttons on them. Apple made it really simple, had a screen, a dial that went around, and a center button. And that was it. And they took all the complexities that you find with, with the, that and innovated a new design to, to match that new technology where you could scroll through things easier and really find, uh, made the, the interface much more attractive for people. Uh, so that innovation in design really helped match the innovation in technology. So two, a, a, a good design has to be useful. There are plenty of architects, artists, and the likes who come up with these amazing, brilliant designs, but they're not functionally useful for the end user. And so then it becomes worthless. I, I dated a girl many moons ago that was an architect, and she was up at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and she and the architectural engineers, so she was an architecture major, and then there were the architectural engineers, were always at odds because the architects would come up with these crazy, you know, innovative new designs that were beautiful. And an engineer that's, you know, architectural engineer would look at it and say, but it's going to fall over. <laughs> and they go, yes, but it has to cantilever out to the blah, blah, blah. It's just, but it's going to fall over, which makes it a worthless building. And, and so there was always this tension between the realities of engineering and the creative design. And ultimately they had to find a way to still be functional and, and, and have that design element. So I'll read this again in case you can't read it. A product is bought to be used. It has to satisfy, satisfy certain criteria, not only functional, but also psychological and aesthetic. Good design emphasizes the usefulness of a product whilst regarding anything that could possibly detract from it, right? Meaning it's designed to be useful, create value in its use, but it doesn't have to do anything more than that. Right. In other words, over designing can also be a problem. Um, but notice it talks about psychological and aesthetic. Aesthetic actually is one of them. Right. But it may not be a functional usage. It may be psychological. That may be part of the value proposition is just that there's a psychological value to it. Right. That you somehow feel good or it makes you you like the colors and it's building a good interface for you that makes you feel more comfortable. That's all valuable in the end, right? So, but it's gotta have the function and the use. Aesthetic, like I mentioned, the aesthetic quality of a product is integral to its usefulness because products we use every day affect our personal and well-being. Mind you, this is 55, 60 years ago before we had this huge onslaught of, of getting into mindfulness and these sorts of things. He was way ahead of his time realizing, um, but only well-executed objects can be beautiful. Right. And so there's this balance between function and beauty. And he says, you've got to work the two together. There is a usefulness to the iPod having just a single uh, dial with a button in the middle. And that was also incredibly beautiful in its simplicity. Right. And so finding a balance between beauty and the aesthetic, along with function, is one of the hardest things to be able to do. One of the things that frequently happens when you get into amazingly creative, like we've got innovation, right, is the first one, useful and aesthetic. You put all that together and you create this amazing thing that nobody understands. And it's like, that's really neat. It's really useful. It's so innovative. What do I do with it? How do I, where's the button for? How can I, and it just, it doesn't quite come together. It's got to be something that it's very understandable at the same time, right? It clarifies the product structure. Better still, it can make the product talk. At best, it's self-explanatory, right? Now, I should have put this picture up. We've all seen that door that has the handle going across that you're supposed to grab, right? And you pull open the door. Is it there to grab or is it there to push? Which one's it there for? 
Well, if you go by far side, <laughs> the far side guy dude showed him pushing on a pull door. <laughs> yep. Right. And there's a sign, you know, Midvale School for the Gifted, yep. right? <laughs> and One of my favorites. But that the concept is when you look at a horizontal bar going across, is it designed to push or pull? It doesn't really tell you one way or the other. It's so what do you end up doing? Whatever you're predisposed to do, usually pushing. Yeah, you have to guess, right? You figure it out. You might look at the frame. You might come up with something. Now, what if you see something that's more like a little handle, right? It just comes down along the edge where the door would open, right? And it's a handle. Then it's a pull. Then it's a pull, right? And so we're trained as users of doors, right? All of us are users of doors. Um, we are now trained to not touch the door, right? We're using our elbows and like getting funny about how we walk through things. But when you see a handle, you grab it. When you see a bar, the natural tendency is to push. And yet there are doors that still to this day design a horizontal bar for a pull. Or worse, they put two horizontal bars on, you know, one on each side of a glass door. And you have no idea which way, and the door only opens one way. Now, if it opens both ways, that might make some sense. But fundamentally, it does not make sense as a design to be understandable that if you're supposed to push, that the bar is a, is a handle, or if you're supposed to pull, that it's flat. It intuitively doesn't make sense. And you see people bumping into doors all the time when they don't have the right handle on it. So even beautifully designed and brilliant and aesthetic and innovative and all, fundamentally, if I can't understand what I'm supposed to do with it, it breaks. It's still useful, right? I can grab the door and open it, but it breaks when it's not understandable. And the power button is one of those things that has become a universally understandable thing, right? We all know what this symbol means. If you didn't, we have to talk right? This symbol you can put on anything. And as long as it's associated with something that looks like a button, we know we're supposed to push it. And we understand that intuitively. And those are the kinds of internal uh, concepts that have been universalized that we want to try to catch on to as we're designing, make it intuitive and understandable to people. Now, unobtrusive is an awkward word, but it's something that is important. Products fulfilling a purpose are like tools. They are neither decorative objects nor works of art. Their design should be therefore both neutral and restrained to leave room for the user self-expression, right? Now, if you look at Google, they made the simplest, most bland, boring website literally ever made in the history of, of all websites. A logo, a search field, and two buttons. And I don't even think they have the buttons anymore, right? It is as simple as you can get. And they've fancied it up now. They'll take and, and create images in replacement of the logo and everything. But really, it's not in your face. It's not complicated. If you looked at search engines that competed with Google, they were incredibly busy. And they were, you know, they didn't make it unobtrusive where it was, you know, like, what am I supposed to do with all of this? Google made it really unobtrusive and simple. You know exactly where to go because there's only one place to go. And the only question you have is, what's the difference between Google search and I'm feeling lucky? Right. And literally the I'm feeling lucky was a way for people to do a tiny little bit of self-expression of, you know what? I am feeling lucky. Like there's two buttons. That's what you're going to pick. Right. Well, yep. Because it takes you straight to result number one. Right. And, and it was a tiny element of self-expression that Google could put into a very basic page otherwise. And so it's something that works for some, it doesn't work for all, but it's something that can be very effective as a tool is to be unobtrusive and simple um, along the way. It's still there, by the way. Yep. Oh, good. That's good to know, because I, sometimes I do feel lucky. Now, honest, this is maybe a, a tongue-in-cheek visual, um, but it does not make a product more innovative, powerful, powerful, or valuable than it really is. It does not attempt to manipulate the consumer with promises that cannot be kept. Now, that last line, promises that cannot be kept, is the driver behind ticked off customers, right? And that's really what never, uh, really can make a big difference, right? Imagine if you opened up an Apple iPhone and you found out it can't call somebody. Now, for some, they may not realize that for months because they don't use the phone to call anybody, right? But imagine it didn't do that. And then they say, but it said it on the product package that, you know, calls not available. Like, well, 
but it looks like a phone. It looks, it works like a phone. My old phone did it. How come this one doesn't? Right. And so that would be an, a broken promise. And anytime you promise something through your design, like if you push on the power button that it, it should turn the power on or off. If you don't do that, you're breaking a promise. So if you, even if you feel like you're being innovative and coming up with a new, whatever, if it's not honest about what it's trying to do, it will just break. And of course, brands are not famous for being honest. That's why it would be called cat videos instead of YouTube, right? Or McDiabetes instead of McDonald's. Uh, but the reality is it's something you have to find ways to be honest with your customer about what the designs, if it's implying that it will do something, make sure it can do it, right? Because otherwise people feel like they've been abandoned. This is something that is 50 or 60 years old. It is increasingly not the case. Um, but long lasting is part of good design. And if you do it right, long lasting will, will be, be a huge value for you. Uh, and durability makes a big difference. It avoids being fashionable and therefore never appears antiquated. So it goes beyond the functional pr production of it can last a long time, like you can use this computer for a long time. It also never appears to be an old computer, right? Unlike fashionable design, it lasts many years even in today's throwaway society. And again, throwaway society 50, 60 years ago was nowhere near the throwaway society that we have today where somebody you know, breaks a screen on an iPhone and they toss it. And it's like, what? You just replaced the screen and you could have it. Nope, I'm getting a new one. And, and so it, there's this throwaway mentality. But if you look at it, the fact that you can build a durable design, if you look at an iMac Pro from 10 years ago, it hasn't really changed that much to today. Smaller, thinner, a little bit sleeker edges, you know, but really the old design still looks timeless. And one of the things Apple's done a great job of, right, is making timeless looking products um, that don't look like they're going to become antiquated. And when you look at many other phones or many other things, it looks like they're, they're old phones, like flip phones now are, clearly look old because nobody makes a flip phone anymore, right? They built the classic standard model of an iPhone layout and a design, and many phones have come along and, and mimicked it to try to get that long lasting design. So many things that you try to design, imagine making it so that it would not look antiquated 20 years from now. So if something is, is a trendy thing, like, oh, everyone's coming in with rainbow colors, Understand that unless rainbow colors were cool 20 years ago, it's probably not going to be cool 20 years from now. And so be careful about what that might do, right? Bold, permanent colors are, are valuable, right? Because they're, they're permanent to the human mind, right? Rainbow colors are fine, except understand that once you depart from a particular color like black or white or grays, right, you start to venture out from colors that will be acceptable, I, I recall the days of the 1980s, which again, most of you were not alive for. Neon colors were the rage. Outfits came in, in neons, hairs, hairstyles came in neon colors. It was, it was a disaster, right? But that was not timely, you know, or it was timely for the time, but it was not permanent. It did not have the long lasting value. And yet you can find, you know, neutral cardigans that were well, very well designed that still look fine today right, that have done very well and lasted much longer. So think about being creative and innovative, but understand that when you cross the line and become too trendy, you lose that long lasting value that could be a, a real pillar. Um, thoroughness is something that's really hard to do when you're early on, but it's incredibly important to do along the path that you go along, right? Nothing must be arbitrary or left to chance which is a very weird thing to imagine. Like, how do we not have any chance involved in what we're doing? Care and accuracy in the design process show respect towards the user. So there's two things in that. One is that it's about the user, not you as the designer, but it's about the user and the experience they end up having. And the more time and energy you put into accurately designing the process, it's the process that matters, not the product. It's the experiences we'll go into in future workshops that matters, not just the product. And I put a picture of an iPhone box here. Anyone want to venture a guess as to why? Why would I choose the iPhone box? That's a great packaging. What makes it great? Oh my God, there's so many things. <laughs> what are some things? I mean, it's it's... 
just a box. Come on, Cynthia. There's got to be something better than that. Yeah, but people save the box just like they do with Moo cards. Um, like, why yeah. would you? Why would you save a box for an iPhone? Well, you know, a lot of people resell the the phone, so they put it in the box when they resell it. That's one of the reasons. Um, you know, some people reuse them for other things. Moo cards are like that. People reuse the boxes for other things. Yep. Um, but you know the whole the whole layout of the box, the way the tray fits in, the way the instructions fit in, the cords are in there correctly. It just it's just incredibly well designed. So do you know? So thank you, Cynthia. Do you know? Have any of you? Some of you've got to be iPhone users. Probably half or more of you, right? What's it like to open up the box? You first get your iPhone. Well, it almost feels Someone like a present. Someone shares. Yeah, Ruth. It almost feels like a present. Like I'm opening up a present. So like when I'm opening it up, it's like, oh, wow, that's so cool. So yep. I like the opening process of getting a new iPhone. One of my favorite parts. So what you, oh my gosh, I wish we, oh, we, we are recording it. Ruth, that's <laughs> exactly what it's part of. It's one of your favorite parts of, of getting an iPhone is the opening of the package. It feels like a gift. Is it light and flimsy, like a like a grocery bag or something? Super um, substantial. I wouldn't say like light, but like when you open it, it just feels like there's like substance there. So when you open yeah, it. Yeah, there's a bit of density to it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, this is a real thing. It's a half a pound phone. Like how do you create a sense of gravity and value in something that is so light, I mean, that the purpose of it is light and will sit in your pocket, you got to make it so it's it feels heavier and more substantial because they you charge, you know, you got charged 800 bucks or whatever for the thing. And, and you don't want to feel like, oh my gosh, it's like, I, it's going to slip out of my hands and fly everywhere. It's like, this is a real phone, right? Do you remember the actual moment of opening the box? Does anyone remember? Like you, you unwrap the shrink wrap, and then you start to pull open the box. How do you open it? Does anyone remember? I'm trying to remember like the specifics, but I think you just, you open the box and there's like a plastic clear like sheet you have to take off mm -hmm. and then the phone comes off. And I think under it, it used to be the headphones, but I'm not so sure with the newer newer ones that don't yep. have the headphone jack anymore. I'm not sure what's under that. Um, okay. Does anyone else find it amazing? Thank you, Ruth. That that Ruth can remember her opening an iPhone. Like, what what product do you have? Your laptop. Your you know that you remember opening the box. It's actually part of the product. Right. And Steve Jobs was the one who initially designed this or didn't design it, but he was particular about this box. And if you've ever, if you can imagine the box, it's a very sturdy box. I don't use an iPhone. Otherwise I would, I would pull one out. Right. But how do you get the bottom from the top of the box? It's actually hard to do because it's flush on the bottom and there isn't a big air gap. And because the cardboard is so sturdy, it actually forms an air suction inside and you have to kind of hold it up and wait for the bottom to drop out a little. And then you grab your fingers on it and then you pull. And what it does is it creates this suction against your pull. So you're fighting a vacuum to open it up, which they found through studies and primarily through Steve Jobs saying, that's the exact experience I want them to have. It creates anticipation. And when it pops, there's like a short little vacuum release that happens it gives a sense of satisfaction. Like, uh -huh, I cracked open the, the treasure chest. And then what you do is you notice, you see this great device that's beautiful and pristine, you know, crystallized and perfect. And then you have to peel off that first layer of plastic that the shielding that they've put on. And then when you get that, you have to peel another layer. And what you're doing is it's like going through a treasure chest is the way it was described, where you're peeling out all the little things. You've got headphones and there's a power cord. And look how cool this cord is. Like, what kind of end tip is that? Like, it was this experience to get to unwrap the package. And one of the keys was in that box, in that whole experience, your phone came charged. Because you said one of the worst experiences with iPods was that people would be told, plug it in 
when you first get it. So you go through this whole unboxing thing. And the first thing this big sticker says in the front is, please charge for at least eight hours before using this. No, I'm not doing that. They just put a $300 into the iPod and they're this. And send it to them charged, which was a whole logistics nightmare of charging and sending a fully charged battery and all this stuff. But they worked hard to make that unboxing experience and the initial customer experience really valuable. So it's thinking through all those little details all the way to the point, like Cynthia is saying, where they keep the box so they can resell it, which gives the perception of long lasting value that I might actually at some point, this might be, they might hold up long enough for me to be able to even sell it down the road. I want to keep this because this is really high quality, right? That's all valuable. So when you think, oh, it'll be great for users and here's my product, take the time with your team to talk all through the experience and go beyond just your product and say, really be thorough. What, where are they going to store this thing when it's not being used? How are they going to hold it? Are they putting it in a backpack? What would it be like in a backpack? Are they putting it in a car? Is it going to overheat? Like think of all those little details to be thorough. And when you do that and you bring some of those up to the judges, what you're going to find is we're going to be impressed by the fact that you were thorough. Now there's a thousand scenarios, but I guarantee you, and Cynthia can probably vouch for this. Anytime you think of a scenario and have accounted for it that the judge didn't think of, they think you thought of a thousand others that they didn't think of and that you must be a good team. It doesn't hurt to have thought through a scenario. And so be thorough. It takes a little extra time, but it's not a long conversation, right? To think of a thousand different scenarios this could go through and take a handful and adjust and improve your design to reflect that. So let's go through the last two of, of his concepts. Uh, this is obviously very timely and given the 60 year gap between us and when he said it, um, thinking through the environment is an element. Design makes an important contribution to the preservation uh, of the environment. It conserves resources and minimizes physical and visual pollution through the life cycle of the product. And you'll notice he talks about the whole life cycle. You're, you want to be smart about how you're, you're being ecologically friendly. It has way more weight now than it ever has. And so it's an even more important element of design is how can this be environmentally sustainable? And one of the things I, I like the most, this to me is one of the best ones. They saved one of the best for last. It's simple, right? It's one of the reasons I really liked this Entrepreneur Center logo that we came up with a few years ago, because we had all these complicated logos and these great ideas and mascot type things. And then someone came up with this just block letter, lowercase a, and we said, this is perfect. It's identifiable, it's simple, it's easy, less but better, right? Because it concentrates on the essential aspects and the products are not burdened with non-essentials, right? Back to purity, back to simplicity. And I like this because it was simple. Then what happens? People come in and say, oh yes, but you have to put the name and you have to put this powered by UCI Applied Innovation underneath. And it's like, no, it was so nice just being the A. And then they ruined it with all this other stuff that has to be added to it every time, right? But the letter, the block letter A was one of the greatest simplicities of that logo as a design element, right? And there are many products that do this. The Apple logo obviously is very simple. Many things that try to cut down to the basics go to very simple things, right? You'll notice some of the best brands aren't colored, right? They're black and white because it goes back to a very simple base type of messaging. Um, so when you're thinking about your product, it's okay to think about it being simple. It's okay if your product has single purpose, as long as that purpose is valuable to the end user and is going to create value to their life. Uh, and that experience is, is well worth it. So again, these are the, the 10 things. And what I'd like to do is we have a few minutes remaining. Um, I'd like for us to talk about, some of you probably have concepts. And what I wanted to do is, uh, is we could do into breakout rooms or we could do it all in this one room. Uh, but the idea would be, how can you make your concept a slightly better design using these 10 concepts? So does anyone object to doing just a quick five or five or six minutes in breakout rooms? Any problems with that? You only have a few people here. You might as well just do it in the main room, David. Yeah, I was just thinking that might get a chance to have more discussion if there's, you know, groups of four or five instead of a group of 10. But then Anyone have a preference? Do two groups of five then. Let's do that. And we'll only take five minutes or so. But the idea would be if you have a concept or if you don't, right, how can you use these? I would take a screenshot if you want or, or whatever. Um, I can also type them into the chat window once you guys get into the room so it sends it to you. Um, 
the, but how can you pick one of these and make your product more understandable or more thorough in what you're doing? You know, think about that, right? And then like I said, we'll get together in, in five or six minutes and wrap up. Any questions before we jump in? It's a quiet group. I know. Another reason for us to go into breakout rooms, let you guys chat and say, gosh, get that guy out of my face. Jeez. All right, let's go ahead and do that. If you guys have questions, come out to the room and we'll uh, we'll work through it. See you guys in a little bit. I'll put a timer on for us. Gusti, let me know if you're having any trouble. Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and, and finish this up. Uh, what? Let's start with what you guys came up with. What What are some things that you? Uh, what are some things that came, did anything pop out from any of your discussions? Even one thing from each room? Uh, well, uh, we, uh, we were discussing about the, like, uh, the, the prototype that we have been working on. Mm -hmm. Like uh, for my team, we are working on a, uh, like a, a fetal monitor, monitoring patch uh, that like, uh, um, try to continuous, continuously monitor the, the fetus. And um, like looking at the, the TN criteria, I, I also took a picture of TN criteria as you presented. So I, I would say the, the our patch, uh, it, um, it would be innovative. Like, uh, and um, like, yeah, to, to make it better, so many things like, uh, we have to work for and right, to, to meet like a 10 criteria you mentioned. Good, and, and that's perfectly okay, right? We're at the beginning of a product. We're, we're, not, we're not, you know, in generation seven of the product. So that's great that you can see there's lots of opportunity for growth. So that's great. Yeah. It's good to hear. How about one more? In our breakout room, I feel like a major thing was environment or sustainability and environmental yep. factors. That's good. And it's what's good to do is to think about that in advance, right? It's very easy to say, oh, we'll just use this product. It's off the shelf. We'll plug it in and it'll take care of it. And it's great to think about that and say, okay, how could we do that device or that component in a more environmentally sustainable way, right? So that we can then be thinking along those lines. Um, and it's about going to every component. It's going to the packaging right? It's going to all sorts of elements about how long the product lasts, how reusable and swappable products are, right? I mean, replacing a battery is a lot easier in terms of the environment than replacing the entire product, right? And so the ability to just swap out a battery is a better design environmentally than it is to replace the entire product, including the battery. So little things like that can make a big difference. Good. So this is obviously just a taste um, you're not going to solve everything, obviously, in a five-minute breakout room, despite what your professors may think. Did I just say that out loud? That's probably not good. Um, you'll, it, it does require time, right? So let's go ahead and wrap up. Let's take a quick peek at, uh, are you guys able to see that uh, the results of the Menti? So this is what you guys came up. Innovation was number one. We like hearing that. We like innovation. Easy to use was another one. If you're not familiar with word clouds, the bigger the word, the more common it was, it was used. 
universally usable, accessible, aesthetic. Uh, someone came up with aesthetic before we even used the word. That's, uh, you know, we showed it. That's good. Convenient, quality innovation, seamless experience, right? That's a, these are great. These are all the kind of things that you'd expect with something that's a well-designed product, right? And it's ultimately uh, what matters. So I want to end this with a couple of things. One is just understand there's lots of resources for you to turn to. These are a couple of them. I'd like to, I'd like to point out, especially the one at the very bottom, the, the library guide on entrepreneurship has access to a tremendous amount of resource, right? And we're, we're very lucky at UCI. We don't realize how lucky we are to have access to the data step databases we do and, and the, the things that we really allow us to, uh, to dig into a lot of data. So utilize these resources. We're going to be going, we're going to take a little while before our next workshop uh, because we want to let you get through finals and, and enjoy a little spring break if that's even a possibility during a, co you know, a COVID pandemic. But, uh, but this is a good shot for you to be working on your product. We want you to have those macro level understanding of, of core design elements. So what are the next steps? Uh, if you have not done so, please do so now to uh, intend to enter. It does not mean you are stuck, uh, that you have to enter or something. There's no commitment involved. It's just a matter of saying, hey, this is something that's important. I'd like to be on the list so that I can get out, get to, you know, get on the, the mailing list. Uh, we will be getting the information out, come whatever it takes in a much faster and more logical way. The design of, of communications will be a focal point this month for us. Um, the next workshop is on... Uh, April 4th. And so I encourage you to put that in your calendar. Uh, that should, that link should work. Um, I, I'll see if I can type it in for you in a second. Um, but it's the same as the first link was just it says workshop two uh, on the Eventbrite. And uh, of course, we have a small crowd today, but share this with your friends and fellow students. There's an opportunity for us to, to certainly grow the teams. Um, I would look for people who are interested in helping you, of course, but also look for people who are looking to compete with you, right? Which you may find is you learn a lot from them. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, to, to go where you need to go with it, right? And help you with your, uh, with your project by watching them grow as well. None of the scoring takes place till the very end. So you don't have to worry about hitting some point in the middle where you know we get cut from the program or something. You got all the way to the end. Stay up to date, obviously, at the website. Um, the product specs are gonna be due on April 11th. Uh, so you've got some time. The product specs do not have to be perfect. They are just, hey, this is what we're looking to do. Uh, the template is up on the website, so uh, don't be afraid to go to that. Um, if you need some help, you've got a question, you're like, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I need a teammate, I need a whatever. Uh, bbcomp at uci.edu should be able to help you. Uh, and uh, there were some questions that came in. This link may be broken. I hope not. I think, I think it may be because of the capital H, just lowercase the H, I it should fix it. Yeah, it worked for me. I'll type what it leads to into the, the window there for you because that's what uh, that's where I, I was able to get the link to work. Oh, um, yeah, but it's unavailable. And then, but I was able to click through and it went to this event, right, which is the right one. So you can click on, on that one too. Uh, the, the other question that came is where can we find these slides? These will be posted. I'm gonna send them to uh, the ICS tech team uh, tonight. And so usually they're pretty quick about getting them up. We'll take the recording and the slides and make them available to you uh, up on that tech.uci.edu slash competition site, right? And of course, what I always recommend Get started now. Don't wait until this product specs due to get your first version in, right? Start drafting it now. It's a template. So just start filling it in. It won't be perfect, but at least you're getting some of the thoughts down. You know, put down text and highlight it saying this has to be replaced, but you know, it gets you off and running. But with that, thank you for being here. Can I answer any other questions before we we let you go and to enjoy your evening? Uh, we are allowed to participate in this as well as the new venture competition, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you do have to choose between Beale and Butterworth, but you don't have mm -hmm. to choose today, right? You've got months to decide that. Uh, and and yes, we encourage people to compete in both. And what will happen inevitably with the new venture competition is I think papers were due yesterday, or I think they're actually coming in today. They extended it by a day. Uh, people will get in there. Some aren't going to make the cut. 
And so you'll see a shuffling of teams take place. And it's a great opportunity to be able to join a team that made the cut or some of the teams that don't make the cut or, or do make the cut end up joining the uh, Beal Butterworth competition. So there's still a lot of activity that goes back and forth between the competitions uh, moving here out. But you definitely can compete in both. No problem at all. Uh, yeah, that link that you put in too, David, says that the event is not available. What? Coming up with a dead, dead uh, page on, on event. Right? All right, I'll have to figure out what's going on with that. But uh, it should be, it's supposed to be available. It's supposed to be public and I don't know why it's not. I'll, I'll get it figured out. The thrills of a virtual environment. Uh, yes, but uh, I'll, I'll get it working. What else? Oh, well, I have a question about uh, like a for Bill student design competition. Um, I um, like what criteria that you guys like judge a project like in terms of like the the design concept or the business model, like how? Yeah. Great question. So if you go to the website, you will see uh, the, 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 the submissions that you're submitting. Um, and what you'll also see is the, uh, you'll see the score sheets. Now those are probably gonna be adjusted slightly based upon some conversations, um, but you'll see that we do measure uh, a few different elements. One of the key ones obviously is your demo and your presentation. Um, but your business case is, is a relatively speaking small portion of um, of the total of the total amount, right? Meaning it's I think about twenty percent. The rest has to do with your your design and your demo um, and your presentation of it. So it's a it's a lot more it's a lot more focused on design than like the new venture competition would be, which really digs into market validation and your financial estimates and all that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit different than that. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Thank you. In fact, I can look here for, um, I think it's on the judging, the rules, guidelines, documentations, and references, uh, where you can see the, the very bottom, uh, I'll put the link in here for you. Uh, that has the bottom judges final scoring and functional and non-functional requirements are, are listed there. Good, other questions? These are good questions. I had a quick question actually, is there a final date by when we have to commit to our product design or choice for what we develop? Uh, great question. So yes, you need to have it finalized. I'm going to take this down so we can be talking to each other instead of talking to a screen. Uh, the the product ultimately, you the, the, even that product spec that happens next month, even if you don't get that in, you can still compete. There is a deadline that takes place uh, further down. And now that I've taken it off the screen, the the timeline is is not it, but it's in May. Um, so when I look here, let me get to the right one. Let me show this to you. So on the, the schedule, if you notice, there's a midpoint review up here on 423, we'll be reviewing it. Even if you haven't submitted that, this final product and business case that's due in May on the 9th, that's when you would need to have everything, uh, a team pulled together and your, your concept. We know that even between that demo video that you create and demo day, your demo will probably change your product will probably change because inevitably good product development, it's constantly iterating. You find out that something does or doesn't work and you modify it and change it and that sort of thing. So it, it inevitably ends up happening where you get some sort of, uh, you get some sort of tweaks that you do and that's all totally fine, right? There's nothing wrong with that uh, in, our, in our book. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions before we let you get to dinner? Uh, I had, had one question. Um, so for the, the programming competition um, or like the software focused one, um, are we required to like upload the code anywhere or is it super like demo focused? Uh, so it's, 
so it is it is demo focused right but you do have to make a bit of the business case and the and why some why the market would care about this right so there is an element of business case but the demo is an important part oh, of it oh not right? the case i meant the code um oh the code yeah we're not going to be delving into your code right okay. so we we won't see it we know there will be probably a uh, a, a fair amount of, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, spaghetti code hacks. sitting underneath, <laughs> right? That hacks that are just, it's it's held together by by digital versions of duct tape. Uh, that's, we expect that, right? Because it's a prototype. It's not gonna be perfect. It's not, um, it, it's not gonna be magically, or it's not gonna work perfectly. Um, but keep in mind, and we're going to talk about this, there are two different types of, of prototypes. There's, there's looks like prototypes, right? And there's works like prototypes. And looks like will look pretty and a nice polished finish, but you, you push a button and it doesn't do anything, right? Kind of thing. And then there's the works like, which has the duct tape hanging out and you've got like some twine holding a section together. And it's like, hey, it's ugly as all get out, but look, the light bulb turned on and that's what matters, right? Is that it worked. And so I think there's a, there's some value to that kind of, um, that kind of willingness to have it uh, look or work up to you, which one you want to do. Some people do both, right? Where they say, this is what it'll look like, but right now it looks like this, but see the light bulb turns on, but eventually it's going to look like this. Here's a nice picture that we, we mocked up, right? And so you can kind of find a way to do, one or the other, right? Um, you don't have to do both. Some people do, and it makes it a little bit easier. By the way, I'm changing the start date on these tickets. I have no idea how it chose, chose March 25th to be the launch date for selling tickets for the event, but it did. But supposedly now you should be able to go to that event right link and see it. Is that the case? Let's see. Yep. I hope so. Yep. You can Yay. see it. So good. So take some time, do that. Um, any last questions before we let you guys get to dinner? Well, let me ask a question that they may be thinking and not asking. Um, if they're doing the software entry, yep. um, are they allowed to do a proof of concept instead of a, of a you know, because, you know, in software we have in between stuff, right? We have like Envision where it's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> Yep. It's all screenshots held together by interactions that makes it look yep. like it's working, but there's no guts behind it. Yep. Um, so are they allowed to enter that kind of a, of a POC? Yeah, yeah. So we, we think of that as a looks like demo, right? Because it's what it would look like if you were to go through and you hover over here and you click on that and it functions. It looks like what it would do. Beneath, none of the codes there. There's no login script. There's nothing. It's just it's all just clicking through JPEGs, effectively, right? And and that's perfectly fine, right? The more advanced your demo, like you say, okay, look, here's our looks like, but you know, the core engine is this, you know, whatever we need, like, and you have something of that, even better, right? But what you do for your demo is is really up to you, and we're going to talk a lot more in depth about that um, as we get further in. But really, it's up to you how. How far can you get by, you know, the early part of May is kind of the, the big the big gating block. In fact, one of the things I'm really hoping we can we can introduce is a bit of a chance for you to tell us the journey that you went on to get to where you currently are. Because if this is demo number seven, right, some prototype number seven that you're working on, right, that's very different than if this is prototype number one. Right. It shows that you've iterated and you've gone through and, and trashed versions and added new and brought back version three and stuffed in a part back into it. You know, like the, that's the way real products are developed is iteratively and through a lot of effort. Uh, so I think it's worth hearing that journey because it shows a lot more that you've refined the product than just left it at a, you know, here it is and, and take it for what it's worth kind of thing. So very good question though. Yeah, it's okay if it's a looks like, which is the way I would classify that. Okay. And and just so you guys know, I mean, David's seen something that I'm working on with my partner and I think we're on iteration about, you know, 57 at this point. Uh, we just keep iterating in quick code. Um, it looks pretty because we dressed it up on the front, but, uh, but we're doing quick iterations before we go to the full-blown uh, you know, coding 
uh, side of it, things. Although there is code behind it that functions. So but one approach uh, that I'll, when you're working on it. Yeah, I appreciate that. One of the things I found is to be really effective is there's there's what what I call core code, and then there's non-core code, for lack of a better term, right? Yeah. Core code is like if you're using AI to match blah 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 and analyze medical records, blah, that's like core stuff, like crazy. You're doing digital analysis of imagery from colonoscopies, like that's crazy stuff. Now you may have a looks like demo that is walking through what the interface would look like for a doctor or for a patient or, you know, whatever it is. And it's more of your envision kind of just flipping through and click here and look, it shows up and that kind of thing. And meanwhile, you've got, you know, a, a nerd in there pounding out how the AI is going to actually do it. And so you have some core code that sits behind this pretty nice interface. And this interface might change all the time. Doctors want a button, patients want a button gone, you know, these kinds of things. And that changes and iterates in 57 different versions. Meanwhile, the core code that's actually doing some heavy lifting behind the scenes, that is, that's being built. Right. And you can say, look, you, you can't really, it's not pretty, but look, you stick an image in and it can tell that it's a colon. Right. And that's as far as we got, but it shows there's some core code behind it. So it's okay if it's disjointed. Obviously, the ultimate would be look, here's a fully functioning version of our product. Right. <laughs> that's that's the ultimate. <laughs> it doesn't happen very frequently. I'll put it that way. <laughs> it's designed to be prototypes. Right. So, very good. This has gone on longer than we uh, we had uh, allocated for you guys. So I appreciate all your time. Thank you for being here. Uh, again, reach out if you have any questions. Uh, I put my email into the into the chat window as well. Uh, DOT, I'll put it in one more time in case it slid up too far. Do not hesitate to ask questions. We're happy to give a hand along this and get started on it. And of course, if you know people in your classes or capstone courses, or whatever that should be a part of this. Please share the information with them. And we look forward to seeing you guys at the next workshop in about a month. In between now and then, stay safe. Good luck with finals and your final projects and everything for this, the quarter. And we'll see you guys in a little brief window here in about a month. All right? Good luck, All right. you guys. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks.